Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Alex Hoyer. When it comes to literary research, an in-depth study of cookbooks might not be the first thing that comes to mind. But Washington University's Rafia Zafar has completed just that in her new book, Recipes for Respect, African American Meals and Meaning. One of our producers, Evie Hemphill, spoke yesterday with the professor of literary and culture studies. She started by asking Zafar what it was that first drew her attention to the idea of food as something more than sustenance. Well, I think um, it goes way back um, to my interest in food uh, when I was an uh, undergraduate in uh, New York City, and I started working for a gourmet food store, um, and I realized how differently people could e eat, like what people decided to eat, what they paid to eat, a particular dish, yeah. and it just got me thinking about the differences between the family food that I had eaten and then working as what I, th I think I was, the first employee of a of a now very famous food store called Dean and DeLuca hmm. in New York City, which now has branches. But it was uh, quite a revelation to me. Well, one particular line in your introduction really stood out to me. You write, when is a cookbook more than a set of instructions? And how might a meal rewrite history? I took those questions to be kind of the overarching framework for understanding the authors and chefs whose stories follow. Does that line up with your hope for readers of this book? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Actually, we're going to be talking about that today in my class. I'm teaching a class on black foodways at, at Washington University. And one of the, the book that's assigned for today is the original edition of the National Council of Negro Women's Community Cookbook. And most people are familiar with community cookbooks as those spiral-bound things that churches and sororal and other kinds of organizations um, put together um, as members of community and often as a fundraiser. Um, so we're looking at the NCNW cookbook not just as a collection of recipes, which may or may not be about foods that we identify with African-American culture, but as a cookbook that is actually um, Dorothy Height, who is the compi main compiler and the head of the NCNW, mm -hmm. um, looks at it. She, in the introduction, she talks about Carter Woodson, and Carter Woodson, who is the historian who is known to have started what we now call Black History Month, but it was Negro History Week, when he noted that despite what people thought, um, that even if you were going to segregated schools, you didn't necessarily know about black, then called Negro history. Um, so his, his um, one of his great input, uh, you know, sort of governing powers in his life was to, you know, build out, make available that history. So what the council cookbook does is along with the recipes, which are interestingly great, grouped by month, um, they build the recipes around sort of uh, historical anecdotes and little biographies of everyone, say, from um, um, Mary McLeod Bethune, you know, the founder of Bethune-Cookman College, to um, Abraham Lincoln. Um, they're, uh, they mention um, um, Elijah Lovejoy um, mm -hmm. talking about the role of of printing presses, and so then also bring up Ida B. Wells, the, the African-American woman who was what wrote the first expose of lynching and worked tirelessly throughout her whole life for civil rights and anti-lynching. So what they'll see is, yes, they will get a collection of recipes, but the recipes are embedded within black history, what we now call black history. So people reading the cookbook not only learn how to you know, put together a delicious meal, but in preparing that meal, they will learn something about their people. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the term foodway? Mm -hmm. That was a new word to me. Right. That's from anthropology. Uh, so that's kind of an, I know, I know, it's kind of <laughs> academic. And um, my, my editor actually said, you know, you should break that down for people because when we say foodways, scholarly <laughs> people know, okay, that's like culture. It's okay. the way, it's all of the stuff around food that goes into making up the culture of particular groups. So there can, we can look at American foodways more generally so that we would look at restaurant styles, what people grow, what people serve, what people eat, um, what people do with food. 
Um, so when I say food ways, I mean that whole constellation. That's helpful. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Um, the African American cooks, bartenders, and authors who you feature in Recipes for Respect really explode some long established stereotypes about black kitchens and black cooking. What are some of those stereotypes, and why do you think those notions have persisted? Ah, well, well, that has a lot to do with popular culture, uh, why those stereotypes persist. I mean, if we think about, well, certainly people in my generation, but even today, you think about Aunt Jemima pancakes. Um, actually, there's a screening of Imitation of Life, which is written by Fanny Hurst, Washington University alum, and made into a film twice, which is essentially the fictionalized story of the black woman chef whose pancakes you know, became an international phenomenon when boxed and packaged in a, a particular way. And the story refers to that notion of the sort of humble African-American woman who was you know, this culinary genius, but hangs back and said, well, no, I'll let you, I'll let you market it. I'll let you do that. And, and that it's the, um, the white um, American wife in the movie and in other um, venues who was seen as sort of the, the driving um, sort of marketing genius and the person who popularizes it. Um, you see this, ba- it goes back to slavery where the ideal, that doesn't mean this was all the time because slavery was, was a lot more nuanced than we think of it in terms of how many, if someone was a slave owner, how many slaves people had, if you had a person you had enslaved, could you spare that person to work solely in your kitchen? It was only sort of the one percenters or the 10 percenters who could have the kinds of kitchens and African-American enslaved workers that you see in like the smashing success of a movie like Gone with the Wind. And Gone with the Wind and Uncle Tom's Cabin in the 19th century, uh, both uh, based on novels written by white women, which really cemented this vision of the self-effacing, loyal, overweight African-American woman who was just a culinary genius in the kitchen, but was unlettered, you know, sort of had this folk wisdom, but she didn't have sort of the education and the drive um, of the, the people outside of the kitchen. Though, of course, that wasn't true. But that was the myth. You know, it's part of the myth to keep um, subjugated people subjugated. Well, one of the things I really loved about your book was just how I learned about um, so many men and women who, who don't fit that stereotype. And three of them are Robert Roberts, Tunis Campbell, mm-hmm. and Tom Bullock, um, who each wrote a guide with really useful and insightful instructions about hospitality work. But as your book makes clear, there's so much more to these texts than that alone, right? Yeah, yeah. And Tom Bullock was a St. Louisan. He's he's famed in St. Louis as being the, you know, the consummate bartender at the St. Louis Country Club. And his book, The Ideal Bartender, came into the world with an editorial from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch in front and the imprimatur of George Herbert Walker, who we remember as the grandfather and great-grandfather of two U.S. presidents. Yeah, Um, I loved the story in there about the different julep recipes and also, uh, can you talk a little bit more about that editorial you're referring to? Yeah, well, if we laugh now and think of of President Clinton saying, he, oh yeah, he tried marijuana, but he didn't inhale, I guess it is always so in the political realm. So um, Theodore, uh, Teddy Roosevelt was in town and he was supposed to be a temperance-oriented man and said that he had tasted one of Mr. Bullock's, you know, delicious potations, his juleps, but he really didn't, he really didn't drink it. Um, and the editorial in the Post-Dispatch said that no red-blooded male could have taken a sip of the ambrosial Mr. Bullock's julep and stopped. <laughs> so essentially, <laughs> wink, wink, yeah, right, we really believe this because Bullock was so famed. And you see the picture of him, um, very dignified in his um, looks like black tie. There's a single picture. And unlike um, the others, there's not much in the way of um, introductory material. Robert Roberts and Tunis Campbell were interest, very interesting men. Um, both were abolitionists um, and had these sort of public roles mm-hmm. as the consummate, you know, the, the people who made, um, in, in Roberts's uh, case, 
the Governor Gore of Massachusetts's mansion run like smoothly and noiselessly. But in his other, you know, in his, what he probably said is in his surreal incarnation, he was an abolitionist in um, Boston in the early 19th century. And in fact, it was his son who led one of the very earliest desegregation fights in the, for the city of Boston and was overturned when they tried to enroll Roberts's granddaughter in a mixed school in, to integrate a Boston public school. So he is, was invented, he was um, um, very active in what were then called the colored conventions, which were the political organizing uh, groups that went on across the United States. Tunis Campbell, who ran a hotel in downtown Manhattan, um, also took, I think, what they learned from negotiating with white, uh, the white uh, sort of ruling class into his um, later life as a Reconstruction era politician in Georgia. So these were men who had to do what they had to do, like Pullman porters, right? So you, you had to conduct yourself, you know, as almost like a, a mask, right? And, and often suffering, particularly Pullman porters, it was real like put downs and, you know, slurs, but doing it because that was something that you did so that you would, could raise. Again, I think about social mobility, right? Being able to build up the kind of wealth that would enable you to educate your children um, in some cases, if you were in the South, to, li to uh, liberate your family members um, and just to get to a position where you could actively um, agitate for civil rights. Campbell and Bullock and Roberts, were they each writing these guides for both white audiences and black audiences? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would actually say that the, one of the things that's canny about them, or um, Abby Fisher, who wrote What Mrs. Fisher Knows About Southern Cooking, or um, a very, very rare book uh, by Melinda Russell, and also a cookbook that's from 1866, that they all were aiming at a white audience for two reasons, one of which is the white, whites were more likely to have the disposable income to buy um, a book. And the other was in that, in the 19th century, we also have a lot of social flux in the white community. And there were lots of hospitality group books and etiquette guides because social mobility was becoming a thing as all Americans were moving towards cities and getting jobs and you didn't know who you were, people were, but you could reinvent yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So getting these guides, these guides became very popular because they were the blueprint, as it were, of, of ascending into the middle or upper middle class. The irony, of course, is that some of these guys were, were, were written um, and were pop, you know, and popular by African-American writers and authors. So you have the very sort of ironic situation of African-Americans who were seen as this lower class, but ones who were particularly um, ex expert in running households or hotels, then turning around and telling whites, this is what you need to do in order to move up the social ladder. My guest is Rafia Zafar, author of Recipes for Respect, African American Meals and Meaning. She is a professor of English, African and African American Studies, and American Culture Studies at Washington University in St. Louis. Professor Zafar, I wanted to ask about one of the other figures in your book who has a connection regionally, at, le at least, um, George Washington Carver. Mm -hmm. I, we so often associate him with the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, but I understand he was a native of Missouri. Diamond, Missouri. Yes, he is. He, um, or yes, he was. Yeah. Why did you choose to devote a section to this man who I think we often remember as the peanut guy? The peanut man, right. And I tell my students, George Washington Carver is more than peanuts. And actually, this Friday, I'll be um, um, invited guest at the Environmental Studies Working Group at Washington University. And I particularly want to talk to them about Carver as an avatar of what we now call farm to fork and organic gardening. So in the late 19th century, early 20th century, Carver turned down a, an academic position at Iowa State where he had gotten his graduate degree in mycology, by the way. He liked fungi and mushrooms, uh, but we now think of them as peanuts and sweet potatoes. Yeah. He, he moved to Tuskegee, he said, because he believed it was his mission. He needed to help his people because he had been born in, into slavery. 
Um, though you can say he was a fortune slave, a fortunate slave, what, you know, talk about a paradox. How can one be a, but as slaves went, he was a fortunate slave. Um, so he went to Tuskegee and of course, People know who Booker T. Washington was, who was a charismatic founder. And despite the fact that what were called ag agricultural extensions um, programs were cited at historically white institutions, Washington managed to get one situated at Tuskegee. And from there, Carver used his, um, his knowledge and his knowledge, his research skills to publish a series of dozens of booklets uh, where farmers uh, of all stripes could learn how to take care of their farms with um, not necessarily with um, um, chemical fertilizers, which had come in strongly after the Civil War because of munitions and what are we going to do with all these new things that we've discovered and realized that was good for farms. Carver knew that um, people didn't have the money, the black farmer didn't have the money to buy these um, these for not like nitro these um, chemical fertilizers. So what he taught was that you could have beautiful gardens and have a very high yield if you just garden scientifically, which would mean for him knowing how to store sweet potatoes in particular kinds of hills, and that you could nurture your your garden and your farm with what he called swamp muck which was actually just compost, right? Leaf mold, like decaying animal detritus, detritus moisture. Um, so he was teaching people organic far farming well over 100 years ago. And he didn't just write these guides and booklets. He also, from what I understand, would travel out around in this cart that right, was the, kind of an early food truck. Yeah, the Jessup wagon, <laughs> right, right. It was a, Essentially, it was a pop-up. Um, and later on, one of his students really took over the Chassop Wagon, and it's named after a, a northern um, philanthropist who, uh, who donated the money to get it up and running. But it was a, a, so it was a cart that could be you know, you know, pulled around by mules, and it would have various extension exhibits, right? If you can't get the, fa the local farmers, and, the, and I will say farmers' wives, though that's very gendered, but that's how things were gendered then, so you could have um, cooking classes. You could have little um, de uh, demonstrations on how to take care of your soil, how to raise um, poultry um, or cows. And his um, the mission was to make the black farmer, who often was a sharecropper, not always, but particularly the sharecroppers, not to plant row like edge to edge with commodity crops, but to make sure that there was an area where the farmers could grow crops that would sustain them over the course of the year. So they wouldn't have to go and buy from the company store. The fourth chapter in Recipes for Respect is titled Civil Rights and Commensality. Mm -hmm. Am I saying that right? Yes. Commensality? Yeah. And Another one of those anthropology <laughs> words. And it means eating together? Yes. Mm -hmm. So. It really sheds light on an aspect of the civil rights movement that in some ways runs all through the struggle of the 1960s, mm -hmm. the presence and absence and even denial of food. In what ways do you hope to deepen our understanding of the role of food in the fight for civil rights? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. If you, again, I'm in some ways teaching my, my course um, as, you know, outgrowths of my books or, you know, they're very... Um, mutually um, enriching. This is the first time I've taught a food way, food ways per se class. I've taught courses on food and literature. Um, when I teach, um, if you know who Ann Moody was, she's in, she is the African-American student in that iconic photograph at the lunch counter being having mustard and all sorts of things dumped on her head. And of those are the white folks who are her allies who are sitting with her. But Moody's autobiography, Coming of Age in Mississippi, is th throughout shot with images of how food was one of the driving forces behind her fight for civil rights, beginning from the, when she was a tiny, tiny girl and her parents were so poor they had to leave her and her little, little sister in the uh, care of, a, of like an eight-year-old cousin and there was basically nothing for them but beans and for the baby, like a bottle of water with sugar in it because they were so poor. And that's one of her earliest images. And then she goes on to talking about working 
for uh, um, racist whites in order to, to make money. Um, her um, sort of uh, one of the revelations that not all whites were like that when her when she ended up eating um, at the same table with one of her white teachers and realizing there was so much about eat not just eating like what kinds of dishes but also that there could be black and white sitting down at the table together and it really I mean that's the whole point of desegregation right when people eat together or where they go to school together they realize they may have differences but there are so many commonalities um Verdame Smart Grosvenor who's one of the writers cookbook writers I talk about in um in signifying dish Verdame says food is food everybody eats mm -hmm. um so that's one of the the stories I mean she leads uh to go back to her when she went to a a historically black junior college. There was um, bad food in the dining hall, and she leads a strike um, mm -hmm. that the food has to be removed. And the person who is really this uncaring, I guess, head of the food service program um, gets her, you know, her dressing down. She goes to the principal. The students go on a hunger strike. It's really you can see Anne Moody is turning into Anne Moody, and all of this sort of these initial actions are about her revelations take place around food. Yeah, her book was really fascinating to me to read about in your book, just oh, how you, it's it's a lot more than recipes. Mm -hmm. The recipes are there and, mm -hmm. and fascinating, but just her story and her passion in the world really comes through. Yeah, she was really a remarkable. She died a few years ago, very young. I think she was, I know, I mean, I'm not a psychiatrist, but if she was very... I think traumatically marked by being beaten and having, you know, as happened when you worked for SNCC, the uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the South. I mean, people disappeared. People were murdered, college students like her, mm -hmm. for trying to register people to vote. Your book is a scholarly one, but I also found it very accessible, and it also seemed to strike a personal tone at times. That's especially clear in your acknowledgments of family members who have shaped your own understanding of food. And your opening dedication says simply, for, for Bill, who cooks? Are there ways in which food and cooking and dining have been fields of action in your own life? Yeah, uh, yeah, actually. My, I mean, I'm quoted many times saying this. My sister and I learned to cook in self-defense. My mother was from Michigan, um, and... Um, she kind of ran away from the Midwest because she said everyone in high school, after women graduated, it was cows, kids, and corn. And she wanted something different than that. Uh, my dad was a jazz musician. They met in Ohio, and he took her to New York City. So my mother worked. She worked sometimes when we were, right, when we were poor, um, like two jobs, maybe three. I think my mother said she had three jobs at one point. But she worked. And uh, my sister and I, when we got old enough, were in charge of getting dinner on the table. So full disclosure, my mom was a terrible cook. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't interested. And you know, and it's not that I think my mother was incapable of cooking. I think she just thought that's not what a career woman needed to take. You know, with you know, this is the 50s when she was, you know, turn in her 20s. She was, she was not, you know. She was faced with uh, like TV dinners and minute rice, and I remember this dreadful stuff called veg all, which was <laughs> like canned, like mixed vegetables. I think it had a white letter. It's like my consciousness is scarred from veg all and minute <laughs> rice. But she could, she was good with meat, as a Midwesterner would be. Um, but um, we often had uh, chicken pot pie and um, TV dinners, which my sister and I would heat up in the stove. When we lived my, with my father and my grandmother, because my parents split up when I was little, my grandmother could cook a few things really well, um, like fried chicken, her fried chicken. Oh, I would love to have her fried chicken again, and I would help her. Um, I'd have there would be paper bags, and she'd have the seasoned flour in it, and I remember being a kid and shaking it, sometimes a little too vigorously, <laughs> so there'd be puffs of flour all over the kitchen. Um, she made oxtail stew. She made greens and I had to make you know my students now don't know necessarily what pot liquor is but that's the vitamin filled broth left over from the greens so I always had to, to drink my pot liquor um, so she had a few things that she made well but I wouldn't say she was an adventurous cook I think some of this actually the story is, is that older women in the family had either owned or ran a, a cafe 
in Atlantic City. Um, and I haven't yet dug that part of my family mm-hmm. history up. But there's a legacy, which I think you can see both, even in my first book 20 years ago, when I look at um, a hairdresser's and a modiste's autobiographies, black women, that there's a, I'm fascinated by entrep- black entrepreneurs. Um, and I'm, because I love reading, I was, became very interested in the books and, that these black entrepreneurs in the late 19th and early 20th century left behind. That was Washington University professor Rafia Zafar, author of Recipes for Respect, African American Meals and Meaning, talking with producer Evie Hemphill. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com.